Hello and welcome to part two of Mr. Lang's vlog review on Madison to Jackson, specifically this time, Jackson. So now Jackson is president, and because of that, he does many different um, policies, we'll say, that do make him seem a little, you know, too in charge. But we'll go over all that. So, check it out. First thing is the Tariff of Abominations. Now, the tariff battle really went like this. First, you had the Tariff of 1816, which put an import on cheap textiles. Then you had 1824, which goes ahead, adds a tariff on iron goods and more expensive woolen and cotton imports. Then you have a Tariff of 1828, also known as the Tariff of Abominations. This one puts higher tariffs on imported raw material, like wool and hemp, um, again, used mainly for paper and clothing. Now, this was supported by the Jacksonians, which are people that followed Andrew Jackson to gain votes. Um, the, so the South, though, was adamantly against it. A lot of it's because, like discussed earlier, now the tariff forces them to buy the expensive goods from the North. Because with the tariff, over 25% duty and sometimes more, it made those inexpensive goods that are imported go up past and may have cost even more than those expensive goods. So it ha they had to buy from the North. The South did not like that. Um, so the tariff of abominations overall favors the industrial north, hated by the south, and South Carolina argues for what we call nullification. Now nullification, this whole issue of nullification, comes to a head in the webster hayne debate. The Senator Daniel Webster from Mass goes up against Robert Hayne from South Carolina. Again, Massachusetts being from the north, we obviously were for the tariff. It makes business go through the roof. The south was against it. Now the webster hayne debate is very interesting because of course you have John C. Calhoun, who's the vice president at the, at the present time, argued that a state should have the power to nullify a federal law if they consider it unconstitutional. This is nullification. The debate ensued. This is very similar to the Virginia-Kentucky resolutions we talked about when we talked about the Alien and Sedition Acts. Again, nullified it if a state thinks it's unconstitutional. Now, Jackson was for the tariff, and Calhoun was not, which made Calhoun actually resign from the vice presidency in 1832, leaving almost a year where we didn't have a vice president, technically. When Martin Van Buren, Martin Van Buren comes in, afterwards. Now he, South Carolina was so mad about the tariff, they threatened to secede and void the tariff, like in 1832. This is 30 years before the Civil War, 29 years. So he, pers he basically, he, he persuaded Congress to pass the fourth bill in 1833, Jackson did there, and that allowed the federal government to, well, use the army and navy against South Carolina if they actually resisted to pay their duties. So, and he made good on his threat. In fact, Henry Clay said that if, uh, I'm sorry, rather, uh, Jackson said that if he ever saw John C. Calhoun, he would hang him from the first tree that he saw. And Henry Clay, the great compromiser, as you know, he steps in, proposes a tariff that would um, gradually lower the duties over the 10 years time. And they were okay with this. And of course, many political cartoons had a field day with this. Now, Jackson's aid of American policy is less than good. He actually puts through, in 1830, the Indian Removal Act, which then brought the Cherokee Nation versus the state of Georgia, which even went further and brought the Worcester versus the state of Georgia in the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court case was, case was pivotal because Worcester, who was you know, a chief at the time, um, was a Cherokee chief, resulted that the Cherokee Nation won the recognition as a community and Georgia could not invade their lands because Jackson wanted to remove them from their lands. They had good farming land there, and that Native Americans, he thought, would just go, and he could have that land to farm. You know, Americans could have that land to farm. So what, what the result was was that the Chief Justice John Marshall says that, you know, he favors and he, you know, in votes in favor of Worcester. And, of course, Jackson likes to get his way. So... Jackson says, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. What does that mean? Jackson goes ahead and forces the Cherokee to sign the Treaty of Nui Kota, which actually forced them to leave their lands and sell it to the federal government for $5 million because he wanted that land that bad. Now, the Cherokee Nation, as you can see, is mainly in Georgia, a little bit of Alabama, a little bit of Tennessee, and altogether we're going to have these five nations who are going to go on what we call the Trail of Tears. Going to be the Seminole, the Cherokee, the Creek, the Choctaw, and the Chickasaw, all going to go to this new territory called the Indian Territory. Now it's present day Oklahoma. And that trail of tears, altogether, we're going to lose uh, about 2,500 to 3,000 
uh, Native Americans on this trail um, as they literally gather their things and move out there. And of course, there's many political cartoons that show otherwise. Jackson's professed love for Native Americans. Now the bank is a whole different issue. Jackson does not like the bank. In fact, Jackson doesn't like paper money, which is ironic because he's on paper money. He's on the $20 bill. But he vetoes, he uses the federal power to veto the charter for the second national bank. And then so starts another debate, this time between Nicholas Biddle, who was kind of an arrogant aristocrat from Philadelphia, but again, president of the bank, owner of the bank. President Jackson felt paper money was useless, and so he's going to be adamantly against it. Um, so the opposition literally comes between soft paper and specie, or hard um, mm -hmm. money. Now, state bankers felt that it restrained their banks from issuing banknotes freely to pull soft paper and supported rapid economic growth and speculation. You know, again, paper money being buying almost on credit at that point. Uh, versus hard specie, they felt that the, that the coin was the only safe currency. And they didn't like any bank that issued banknotes. Um, and of course, they were suspicious of any type of uh, speculation, any type of credit. But the monster is destroyed, including the pet banks. In 1833, Jackson vetoes it, the extension of it, the charter expires, and the bank goes bankrupt, which actually leads to not only the downfall of the mother bank, but even worse, leads to um, the Panic of 1837. Um, and of course, people are like, King Andrew, hmm, is using his power a little too much. So moving right along, the Panic of 1837 was pretty crazy because we have banknotes start to lose their value because of the, the closing of the bank. Land sales start to plummet. Credit's not available anymore. Businesses begin to fail. And because businesses fail, unemployment rose. Now, the Panic of 1837 literally hit everybody. It was a huge recession for the time. And it spread very quickly. Again, it literally spread in the major cities and then out west eventually. But Andrew Jackson by 1837 is, he's no longer, he's out, he's enjoying retirement. Um, I always love to do fun facts about him. He's got some great fun facts. He had two bullet flaws in his body his entire life. On the last day of his presidency, he had two regrets. He was unable to shoot Henry Clay or hang John C. Calhoun. His favorite food was pancakes. Uh, Richard Lawrence attempted to assassinate him once. He actually pulled out one gun and a misfire, pulled out a second gun and also misfired. So Jackson tackled him to the ground and beat him. He also had a scar on his arm and his face uh, by his eye because when a British officer during the Revolutionary War, as a, a young child, actually struck him um, with a sword. Uh, his wife, Rachel, died a month after he was elected president. Um, she married Jackson after her divorce with her former husband went through. And because the divorce didn't go through, Again, a lot of that mudslinging was based on racial. He had 11 kids. None of them were his own, including two Native American kids. Um, he killed Charles Dickinson in a duel, um, which actually, you know, Dickinson leaves a bullet near Jackson's heart. Um, that's where it is last for the rest of the life. That's his life. And that's because Jackson's gun actually misfired. Um, but he actually, like, clutched his chest and shot again, they say. Um, Jackson had a 1,400-pound block of cheese at his famous inauguration party, which had the spike punch. Um, the cheese got caught in the carpets and stuck up the White House about a couple weeks after. Um, he had a parent named Paul, and it was moved from his funeral, actually, because it was uh, cursing so much. And he was almost assassinated in 1833 on board a steamship, but he was attacked when he was attacked by a former Navy officer, um, but he beat the assassin with his cane. And this is a photo of Andrew Jackson one year before his death. Um, again, he's quite the most controversial president um, that we've had. He's one of the most controversial for sure. Um, and I hope you learned a lot today between part one and part two. I'll see you guys in class.